Ready? Play. Hey guys, before we jump in today's episode, we have some exciting news. We recently partnered with TruePro. They're a great place to buy strings, grips, and tennis apparel. Use discount code PAINTINGLINES, that's one word, for 20% off store-wide. You can find the link in our bio. Welcome back to Painting Lines. Last week, we broke down the three big tournaments that were going on, and uh, this week, we'll recap the two indoor tournaments that are going to build into the final Masters event of the year in Paris. So, Eric, uh, just going off these tournaments, what's one thing that stood out to you most from uh, these two tournaments that just happened? Yeah, one thing that stood out to me the most is just the lack of names that I'm used to seeing making big runs in these tournaments. Like, for example... Djokovic, Zverev, Tsitsipas, Rude, Rublev, Medvedev. Like, I'm not seeing them in the finals anymore, or even like making that deep of runs. And I feel like the theme with these, the two tournaments that just happened, um, you know, the two big 500s, and we're seeing a lot of newer faces. I feel like, other than Hatchinoff, a lot of up and coming talent. And Hatchinoff is a relatively new face. He's not a young guy, but he still like hasn't been, I guess, like where, how, how well he's been doing now. And I just think, you know, we're, we've been seeing or we have seen a lot of guys outside the top 10 in this past week just trying to seize opportunities and come for those people who are in the top 10, their launches. Basically, you know, they're they're trying to make moves. And I feel like we're seeing it in real time, like kind of a passing of the torch. Yeah. And I mean, you also didn't have a Alcaraz or Sinner playing. So that's a, an, another aspect of the uh, the depth myth missing there. Uh, and with, with Hatchinov, I feel like he he has played at this level before. It's just kind of like a resurgence for him. Right, exactly. I mean, what, what a couple of weeks, right? Exactly, exactly. But anyway, you want to hop right into uh, the Vienna Open? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so uh, first round in the round of uh, 32 here, we had uh, team's last match, which uh, – you kind of predicted that it was be, I, it would be his last match. I totally jinxed that. Yeah, I, I mean, know. he was up a break in that match early, and I was like, oh, maybe he'll get through at least one round. And Because his first actual ATP win came in Vienna, so it kind of would have been nice if his, his last ATP win was there as well, but ended up uh, getting broken back and losing that match. So, bummer. But honestly, a very solid career. It's weird, though, when you think about it, because I feel like sometimes – you almost look at winning a grand slam like you would winning an MVP award in the league where it's like, if someone has uh, won a, a grand slam, you're like, okay, this dude is almost automatically like a legendary player. Mm -hmm. But when you look at someone like team, it becomes a little bit more iffy where you're like, okay, he won a grand slam, but it was only one and he was never like the number one player in the world. So it becomes a little bit on the edge there. Yeah. I feel like, most of his reputation comes from just like him as his likability and I guess his kind of uh, like aura on tour. Like, I don't know if he'll be a hall of famer based on stats, but he kind of has that Roger Federer feel of, like people always consider Federer the goat, even though Nadal and Djokovic have achieved more than him just because of, I think of his like personality and how people who, don't know tennis as much know Roger Federer. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like team's kind of a guy that can skate by on um, like a personality trait other than than pure stats. Yeah, but I think with Federer, it's just like so much more, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's different. I was just trying to make that comparison as like, yeah, I mean, you said it gets a little murky with team because we don't know how, like, for example, him or Medvedev, who's had a better career, right? Medvedev because he's been number one? Probably Medvedev because he's been number one. I think he's also won more titles. Mm -hmm. So probably Medvedev, if I was going to then you can argue that Medvedev, there. You can argue that Medvedev did not have the head-to-head -head record that team did against the big three. That's true. Like, he didn't have so the head-to-head -head record, but yeah. you also could argue that team's grand slam, he got really lucky. He did. He did get very lucky. And Whereas, whereas Medvedev stopped Djokovic from winning the calendar <laughs> slam. So you can't really argue that Djokovic was off his game. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to think here, like take Medvedev, for example, even though he may not be established as Medvedev, I think what I was trying to tie in earlier was team style, like 
his shot making ability, like his pure aesthetic and entertainment value. Whereas Medvedev, he wins, but he's got a pretty boring playing style, right? Like he just gets out there and grinds the opponent down. Whereas his team has a beautiful one handed backhand that he can just strike winners from the baseline. I feel like that's maybe why people like him more because he's more fun and entertaining to watch. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, likability, it's a good mm-hmm. point. Like how much that factors into it. Mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, moving on to the other uh, match I wanted to highlight here in the round of 32, uh, Nakashima defeating Tommy Paul. This kind of just goes with a trend here. Like, I mean, obviously Paul played uh, really well last week, but just the trend of Nakashima playing better and better. It seems like he uh, kind of conversely to how uh, Shelton just exploded onto the scene and was already like top 20 after one year on tour or whatever, or kind of similar thing with, with Mickelson where he just exploded on was like, okay, now I'm like a, a top 50 guy. Nakashima seems to be having more of a slow grind where he's getting bigger and bigger wins and making it further and further over time. Yeah, definitely. And I think when we talk about top Americans, he tends to get left out of the conversation, but I feel like now he needs to be, you know, consistently in it, right? Like when we mention them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, probably consistently in the, the top five we we're talking about their top 10. Yeah. It's, it's tough to say because you wouldn't really compare him to someone like Taylor Fritz as being like the top American. Yeah. I feel like how it used to be at least was, so we would always group Fritz, Paul, Tiafo kind of together. And then maybe after like Shelton, Korda, like a Mickelson, yeah. And then where do you think Nagashima kind of fall? I think Tiafo gets bumped back. If I was, yeah, if I was going right now, I'd probably <laughs> say Fritz, Paul, Shelton, Tiafo, Korda, Nakashima, Mickelson. Mickelson. Yeah. That's what that's what probably how I'd rank it right now. And that might yeah. be that might be purely what they're actually ranked. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just think Mickelson and Korda could be switched. Just you think because Mickelson's I, better than Korda? No. Well, I think he might be ranked better than Korda, but I think Korda gets the better grouping because he kind of has like a I, I see him as having more potential, but just being plagued by injury. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. I th- I think in unless I'm wrong, I think Korda is ranked higher right now. Yeah, probably because that he had a title in DC. Yeah, and he made the the semis in uh Canada, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, he probably is. But yeah, no, it's disappointing because Paul, I feel like after last week, he's like you're trying to see him make a run into turn and then boom, just out you know, in the first can't round. really follow up his his uh his title. Yeah. Moving on though, uh speaking of Tiafo, he lost in the, the second round here, got a win, so not his worst tournament of the year, but loses to Berrettini. So on the one side, you have Tiafo disappointing, kind of as most tournaments go for him. Like he has those every once in a while a breakout, but a similar situation here where he just underperforms, it seems like. And then Berrettini, who getting a couple wins in a tournament is, is solid for Berrettini, just collecting points slowly, moving back up in the rankings, getting back up closer to the top 20, hopefully uh, in a little bit here. Yeah, good to see. I feel like we haven't really been seeing like deep runs by Berrettini, so this tournament was kind of a good uh, establishment for him. Yeah, and then uh, Mahach defeating Dimitrov. This was a little bit of a surprise, but also Mahach has been playing playing very well. He has some big wins this year, and uh, we were a little worried about him after he had that injury in the Davis Cup, but uh, gets the win here over uh, a big opponent. Yeah, I feel like I got hustled on this one because remember I took him for the bet of the week and he had previously retired due to illness and then he just gets out here and, you know, beats a very solid opponent. But yeah, Mahach, definitely someone to keep on the radar. 100%, 100%. Um, but anyway, moving on to the quarterfinal, here's where we had some some pretty intense matches. I mean, first of all, Musetti winning a three-setter over Zverev and – one thing I, I want to bring up coming into this match is I know it's not like a grand slam where time on court is massive, but Musetti did get a walkover versus Monfi in the round of 16. So I'm wondering if that maybe helped him out taking that final set uh, in this match against Zverev where he just had 
uh, an extra day or two of rest. Yeah. And Musetti is a physical player too. So I feel like any extra day he can get helps and Zverev plays. He tends to play pretty conservatively too. So these points were long and drawn out. So I think it definitely helped. Yeah. And, and when you have a guy playing a little bit more conservatively, it, it, feels like that's almost a disadvantage in the in the indoors where the conditions are very consistent. And so if Musetti wants to go for a big shot, he's not going to get a weird spin, as much of a weird spin on the ball or a weird motion from wind or anything like that. It's going to be the same ball bouncing over and over again. Yeah, definitely helps with the the one-handed backhand, right? At least being able to control it more. Yeah. 100%. I wonder how those exchanges, because Zverev, he, he has one of the best backhands on tour, and Musetti's got the one-hander. So in that, like I feel like Zverev should have tried to stay in more backhand-to-backhand rallies. I kind of pin him in that that corner. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you'd think if you have a very solid backhand, you want to just consistently give that one-hander a high, yeah. high spinny backhand that he has to deal with, which is going to force him to try to take it on the rise probably. Yeah, yeah. And Musetti, I he's this is kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like someone who's outside the top ten, but is slowly making their way up, like beating Zverev in a quarterfinal. And he's been having a solid year so far. Definitely a solid year. I mean, great run at Wimbledon mm-hmm. and uh has some big wins. Yeah, like excited for him. Exactly. Uh and then we had a uh, obviously Hachinov handled Berrettini, I think wasn't that close of a match. And then uh the, the, what really stood out to me was Deminar and Draper both having battles with Mensik and Mahach. And what this really says to me is kind of like you were saying, there's a lot more depth in, in the field right now where it's very balanced. You look at Deminar and Draper and they're closer, they're higher up ranked. But even if you go all the way down to where Mensik and Mahach are ranked, they feel not super separated. Whereas if you go back maybe eight years if you were talking about a top 10 or top 15 guy, it felt like they were pretty far separated from a guy that was maybe in the forties rankings or fifties. Yeah, totally. I mean, looking at the line before the Mensik Deminar match, I saw Mensik having positive odds. And it's like you said, it's like, even though Deminar is the better player, it felt like, Oh, there could be an opportunity here. Mensik, like I wouldn't really count him out that much, but it's great. He um what went up the first set, right? Because I remember texting you, you're like, Oh, I hope that bet doesn't hit. And I'm thinking in my head, all right, best case scenario, because I love Demon would be Mensik goes up early, cash the bet out, and then Deminar wins. And I didn't cash the bet out and Mensik lost. So at least Should've it's one of those, all right. <laughs> your player wins, but you lose the bet. It's kind of a I guess a win win. Yeah, win lose, right? <laughs> yeah, win lose. Um, yeah, but then, so, uh, in the semifinal, we had Hatchinov just continue his impressive win beat Staminar, like we were just talking about, uh, the demon and, uh, Hatchinov follows, he made, had the title last week and then makes this run here to the final. So great run from him and just very solid performances overall. Hatchinov is a guy that it seems like he's obviously recently been doing very well, but hasn't had the greatest year overall he seems to be very comfortably kind of sitting in that teen to 20s ranking where almost like umber who we'll probably talk about in a little bit if he does poorly we don't really talk about him and if he does well we do talk about him yeah i just kind of expect him to do like it's a name like oh hatch okay like he should be doing well yeah but then if he loses in like the second round we also are like, oh, okay. I guess yeah, uh, I'm not yeah, super his, surprised. His name doesn't like hold much value, but I guess yeah. The, really, the only notable thing of the summer Hatchinoff was involved in was that longest U.S. Open match ever against Dan Evans. It was like five and a half hours. Yeah, unfortunately, like, I feel he like, was on the, the wrong side of it. Right, I know, but that just like brought his name back in the spotlight. Like, oh yeah, Hatchinoff. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then yeah. Uh, Draper beating Musetti. I mean. Interesting thing about this round was both matches 6-2, six, 6-4, six, so not not the closest match, and both of them were kind of uh, upsets. So interesting to see that the the underdog kind of handled their opponent pretty easily. Yeah, definitely. And then just last thing on Hatchinoff, I feel like this could have been a confidence thing too where he wins the title last week in Almaty, um, comes in hot here, 
and unlike Paul, is able to like leverage that title into a deep run. Yeah, I was about to like, say it's like the opposite. Sometimes right. <laughs> you have that hangover after you get the, the title, and then other times you can actually build with the momentum. Yeah, yeah, but no, Draper, exciting, exciting game. I wonder if if the the kind of point you're at in your career impacts how you deal with like winning a title. Because if you look at someone like Tommy Paul, it's like he's very established, he's in his spot, and he gets the title. And then he comes in the next week and it's like, oh, I'm just doing the same thing again. Like, I just have to do it over and over again. Whereas Hatchinov, he's kind of building momentum and he's like, oh, I got the title last week. I can build that into doing better this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it all depends. I mean, I don't want to judge Paul's character, but I feel like he, you know, probably was pretty content after the title and was like, hey, you know, maybe I'll just uh, enjoy Stockholm for a bit, fly over to, to Vienna, you know, not a big deal, like make a vacation out of it almost. Yeah. I mean, I obviously can't, can't see inside <laughs> their heads, but right. It, it does see, it's kind of a bummer to see uh, that it went that way for him, but for Hatchinov, obviously great job. Mm -hmm. And then in the, the final here, Draper uh, handles catching up in uh, two sets. I think it was like six, four, seven, five. Uh, honestly, just an impressive year for Draper here. He's up to 15, the world now and has two titles on the year, as well as making, obviously, the semifinal run at the U.S. Open. So just really impressive for him. Almost reminds me of what Shelton kind of did last year, where he kind of blew up from, obviously, I think Shelton was a little lower at the beginning of the year than Draper was, but still rising, rising up into the, the mid-teens. Yeah, and the Brits finally have their next uh, great hope coming in yeah. after Murray to follow up in his footsteps. 100%, 100%. Yeah, well, I mean, at least it, it's interesting with Draper because these have been indoor tournaments. Remember his, like, physical shape and we were worried about whenever he plays, like, over the summer and humidity and hotter climates? He doesn't really do well, but now we're probably going to see him, like, really it not being an issue, and this is kind of his, um, like, his time to shine, really. Definitely plays uh, very solid in, in indoor conditions. Mm-hmm. Doesn't get very hot there in uh, in Great Britain. Yeah, they got the air conditioning <laughs> in the uh, in the indoors, right? Right. I, I I was kind of thinking about that when you look at how Shapovalov and uh, FAA play. It's like mm -hmm. in Canada, how often are they playing indoors versus outdoors? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Jeez. But anyway, uh, let's head over to uh, Basel for uh, the Swiss indoors. So obviously, this is a is a cool tournament i i'm always a fan of this because i remember watching federer play in this tournament uh when i was younger so that was always a a cool one to watch but uh yeah let's jump into the round of 32 here we had uh bautista Agut defeating rude so uh rba's run of solid form just continues after obviously getting a massive title out of nowhere last week just cool to see him not have kind of what tommy paul had where he just dropped off just at least getting a win in the first round here. Yeah, man. I don't, what is going on with Rude, though? I wonder if we'll start seeing Rude pick and choose his tournaments to be, you know, clay-focused, which they already are, but if he's just going to start sitting out of these hardcore tournaments. I don't think you even really can, right? Aren't you, like, forced to play in a certain Yeah, I guess you're right, because even those clay rats from South America still play these hardcore tournaments. Yeah, I wonder if they're doing better than Rude is right now. <laughs> yeah, well... What's that website called where you were looking at? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll bring it up Google earlier rankings. or later, I mean. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in terms of the uh, the indoor hardcore rankings. But yeah, you can check and I'm pretty sure Root is uh, not mm. in the top area. <laughs> oh, man. But then uh, another match of uh, interest in the round of 32 here was the battle of the old dogs with uh mm. Vavrinka and Manorino and uh Vavrinka gets the dub so cool to see him doing well and especially in his home country uh nice for the the hometown fans yeah definitely and just speaking on Manorino and no need to kick Paul while he's down but he just beat him in uh Paris right now like pretty oh wide. my gosh well, I know. Well, right now <laughs> Right, like literally, at, like right before we hopped on here, because I was checking the lines and I saw Manorino was up a set on Paul, and I live betted Paul like plus four thirty five because he was also down 
a break in the second, broke back, like got it to five five, and then he actually his odds turned to negative. It was like minus one oh five. And you cashed out. Did not cash out. <laughs> Could have cashed out for a fifty percent profit, and then boom, he loses seven five second set to Manorino. Damn. Good job, How? Manorino, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. So yeah, damn. That's crazy. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say here about this match, but that's that's wild to hear that Tommy Paul's already out of uh, of Paris. Really, not a good sign for uh, his uh, chances of making it to Turin. I know. What a bummer. And Manorino but, too. Like, yeah, <laughs> who hasn't had the best year? Yeah, to be honest. Like we we talked about last year, Manorino had like the best year of his career. And then he followed that up with not a great year, but I guess, I guess still good enough to beat a guy that's top 15 in the world. So, yeah. And he had the home crowd behind him. Maybe that's true. Uh, that's true. a little bit there. But anyway, uh, moving on to the round of 16, we had Goffin defeating Umber. Uh, I talked about Umber earlier with the, the lack of consistency. It just doesn't make that much sense to me to see a guy, I guess, top 20 in the world. I guess maybe that's the separator between a guy that's top 20 and top 10 in the world is a top 20 guy can make big runs at these uh, high level tournaments and generally will do well, but also has uh, some consistency issues. Whereas a top 10 guy, you kind of expect them to win a couple rounds every time. And if they don't win the couple rounds, it's because they did better. It's not because they're losing in the first round. Yeah, that's a good point. And I also think you can have guys who are in the, like top 10 or you can have guys in the top 20 who may have or may be more talented than guys in the top 10 but they're not as consistent like for example and bear i think this kind of makes sense from him like his lack of consistency because if you've seen the way he plays he plays such a high risk high reward style that he's either gonna you know paint lines or he's gonna make airs like this is kind of what i expect from him and i think it benefits him in certain instances where like hey he may be hot and he makes a run and wins a title or he loses second round yeah i get yeah 100 percent. i mean you look at someone like shelton and you compare him to someone like dimitrov i mean dimitrov has had some high level results this year made the final in miami but it's like if you were looking at those two guys it would not be a shock to see shelton beat dimitrov like pretty handedly because Shelton plays that higher risk style of game. Mm -hmm, Definitely. And I think Medvedev comes to, comes to mind too, as far as someone who's consistently like in the top five and is a very consistent player, but is, is very conservative and could be beaten by anyone really. Yeah. But I I feel like with Medvedev, he's so high level that it's like, if you had a Shelton versus Medvedev match, you wouldn't say that Shelton is favored. No. He could win, but you would you definitely be like, ah, I'm definitely leaning Medvedev. Yeah. Yeah. It's just hard, man, with center owning Medvedev these days. Like you kind of I kind of lack I'm lacking like the respect I should for Medvedev. Just I think I think I think so. Results, yeah. You look at his results and you're like, oh, he's I know. made it like a past a quarterfinal recently. It's like, yeah, that's because yeah. he's always in the same quarter as center. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh. But uh, and then uh, other match in round of sixteen was uh, the defending champ FAA out to uh, Impeshi Paracard. Not great for FAA's ranking point standing, just because obviously he loses all the points that he he got from that tournament last year. Uh, it falls to number twenty seven in the world with really only one great result this year, which was obviously back in Madrid when he made the final on that relatively lucky run. So mm. I think. Uh, these next six months are going to be pretty critical for him because uh, building up into that tournament, he's going to have to collect a decent number of points or he might drop back into the the low forties. Yeah. I wonder where, like if he does drop into the low forties, if he starts playing challengers again and like building up that confidence and then tries his hand back on the, on the ATP tour. Well, I mean, you, you look like at what, where like shop of all is right now. I mean, I think shop of all ranked somewhere in the, in the forties. Mm-hmm. Or he maybe even lower, and yeah, obviously he's he's still playing in these biggest tournaments. Yeah, but remember what we were talking about? It's like, do you want to just 
play one and done like every week in these big tournaments? Or do you think you should go play smaller tournaments, make runs, get wins, like collect the confidence and then make it up if you can? Like it's a good point. You no, know, it's 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 something that every player I think has to consider. Like even Murray had to drop his ego for a bit and play challengers. Yeah, but I think that was more when he was already on the way out. <laughs> yeah. Um rest in peace. Yeah, RIP, our boy, Andy Murray. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, moving on to the quarterfinal. Uh, speaking of a Pesci pair of card, he defeated the other Canadian, Chapo, in a uh, three-set battle, which featured two tie breaks. So very close match. And it's one of these things where we've talked about it uh, with, like, Popper and when he won in Canada. You kind of get that retrospective, oh, I guess that loss isn't as bad, where it's like, Oh, FAA loses to Bishop Paracard in the round of 16, but the further Paracard goes, the less bad that loss looks. Oh, yeah. You can have Chapo and FAA chop it up on the phone after and be like, dude, can you believe this guy? Like, that was insane what he was doing out there. Like, they're not, uh, I don't think they're really taking this one to heart. I mean, like, it's, he's, a, he's an amazing player. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Couple upsets in this this quarterfinal. Uh, Fields defeating City Pass, but it's one of those ones where not really an upset to me, just in terms of how Fields been playing, especially indoor. He won that tournament uh, a couple of weeks ago, and for City Pass, it's like you can't really expect that much better. If he had made it past this round, I think it would have been a great run for him. But mm-hmm. I mean, winning a couple rounds, losing to a good opponent. Not not the worst showing, I think, from Sitsi Boss. Yeah, I like what you said last week about an upset on paper, but like in reality, you know, I, I don't think this was an upset either. It just was because of the, the ranking disparity. Exactly. And then uh, Rublev out in three sets to Shelton. I mean, this is kind of goes a perfect example of what we were talking about earlier with Rublev generally being a, a pretty solid player. I mean, we know he has his issues with uh, – losing control and losing in the first round, but playing against Shelton, Shelton playing just that high risk game. And I think this was just a match where uh, if you, if you like the, the big baseline rallies, I mean, I'm going to talk about this match a little bit more because it's my match of the week, but if you like those big baseline rallies with two very physical players, this is the match to watch because both these guys just have massive ground strokes. And uh, speaking of Rublev, it's kind of interesting to see because at the beginning of the year, we were kind of talking about, oh, he's losing every single like first round uh, match. But recently, since the end of July, he's actually gone 18 and nine. He was the finalist in Canada, which kind of gets balanced out by that first round exit in Shanghai. But 18 and nine to me at least shows some level of improved consistency, but where it shows you're at least making it to like the third round on average. Mm-hmm. How is he doing right now as far as the race to turn? Is he in the I'm top I'm pretty sure he's still, in. Or? I believe he's like number seven, but I don't know if gonna Djokovic is going to make it. It's going to be tight, but I don't think – I don't even know if Djokovic is going to play in it. But yeah. there's a lot of stuff up in the air with, with the qualifying there at the end. Yeah. But the question is also who's going to pass him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not the way Tommy's playing. Yeah. But anyway, uh, moving on to the semifinals, we had a, a semifinal with four young players, all the uh, all the young talent. And uh, first up, we had Pesci Pericard now collecting another big win over Runa. Runa, we didn't really talk about him in the, the first few rounds because didn't really have the, the hardest draw, but still, I think, a decent job to, like, not, not underperform with that easy draw. Like... We, we sometimes say, oh, this guy got an easy draw to whatever round, the, the quarters, the semis, but you can just as easily lose in an earlier round still. Like, just because it's easy doesn't mean those matches don't exist. So I, I still think a good job from him to make the semifinal and obviously massive win for Pericard now in the, the final of an ATP 500. Yeah, totally. And I I like what you said earlier about like, even though you may have quote unquote an easy draw, like it could be matchup dependent too. So you still got to go out there and play tennis and get wins. So yes, credit to Runa. I feel like he's kind of been on the struggling end. So it is good to see him back. Like this is someone who is supposed to be, 
you know, part of this new big three with Sinner and Alcaraz, but has been like drastically behind. According so, to Runa, it's for new big three. <laughs> according to according to Runa, yeah, yeah according to uh, you know everyone, right? Yeah, he's like yeah, everyone's um, saying this. Yeah. I've heard it. I've heard it from everyone. He's like, yeah, asking for a friend, but like, you know, like, are you hearing this too? You, you guys hear about this new big three guys? Like me, uh, Alcaraz, and Sinner? They're like, wait, you mean the number one and two players in the world and then you? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, man. And then the other semifinal was uh, Shelton and Fields. So two more uh, next-gen guys that uh, just are performing very well. And uh, mm-hmm. this set up – a final interesting final with two massive servers shelton and uh pericard yeah i know freaking bombs i saw pericard's uh i think he had 131 mile an hour second serve that's just nuts and he topped out at 138 like this is ridiculous i know because shelton hit what 140 at the u.s open i think 150 didn't he damn yeah pretty crazy yeah yeah, I remember when we were there and we heard those people talking behind us. We were watching Dimitrov and Rublev, and I think they were dishing out like 110, 115 mile an hour serves. The guys behind us were like, dude, Shelton serves like 150 every time. Yeah, they were like, like Shelton serves slow. 150. These guys like have some pretty slow serves. And I was like, yeah. dude, 120 is – like they were hitting it like 120. And I'm like, yeah. that's not slow, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know we clearly see who like the real tennis fans. Are. Yeah, I, I don't know, but anyway, final with the two big servers and uh, and Pesci Paracard takes it. So really impressive. Uh, I mean, this is his second title on the year, and he's already nearly top thirty. He actually started the year outside of the top two hundred players, so wow. just rocketed up the rankings, and uh, just impressive to see. Yeah, this is awesome. I think it's good for the sport because you have a big guy. I feel like he's not even a serve bot either because he can still rip winners from the baseline, but he still plays a like a big guy game. You know, he serves in volleys or he does what you like to say, the serve plus one. Yeah, serve plus one. Well, that's serve plus one is is more like a serve and a forehand. Right. Yeah, because and he's got people respect his forehand too. Cause I was watching a lot of his highlights. He'll hit a serve. You know, it'll come back weak and he's in an approach position at the service line. Just clobbers it. He could either clobber or he'll nice and easy drop shot because people stay back on him. Like yeah. it is so dangerous. 100%. So, yeah, I, mean, I, I love watching. Yeah, that's what where Alcaraz gets his uh, that excellent uh, drop shot is because people are just afraid of his forehand. Yeah, got to respect the forehand. But yeah, so uh, that wraps up the tournaments here. And uh, we're looking forward to, to Paris this week. And uh, obviously, we're getting a little bit of a preview there with Tommy Paul. But uh, <laughs> anyway, you ready to uh, hop into segments here? Yeah, let's do it. All righty. What's new in tennis? What did you see this week? I saw another center controversy. And to me, this one is absolutely ridiculous because he came under fire for saying in an interview that he didn't play the Six King Slam for money. Rather, he just wanted to compete with the best five guys in the world. And he actually doubled down and said that he doesn't even play tennis for money. And I don't know why people are like really pissed off about him saying that. Like, I I don't really understand why. And you even had Stan Wawrinka take a jab at him and like quoted the tweet, put laughing emojis, which he actually ended up deleting because I think people came, you know, attacking him and it's just like everywhere sinner goes the guy cannot catch a brick you know like everyone's just up his ass critiquing him about every little single thing he does yeah i mean i don't really understand what there is to be angry about there like right you're mad that he's not just doing it for the money they're like oh well if you didn't do it for the money why don't you donate all that money to charity huh uh, that's just not how the world works, <laughs> yeah. dude. Sorry, like that's just it, yeah. Say any sort of argument about like, oh, why don't you just give the money away? Then I think yeah. is really stupid. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know this. Not this to one, get political, this, but right, right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's. Uh, I don't know why people got so angry about it. Yeah. Yeah. That just like seems... it's a job at the end of the day, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a job at the end of the day, but like, I think what he's saying is. 
he loves playing tennis and mm-hmm. he's like, I don't do it just because I want to make money. And I'm pretty yeah. sure that's probably what he meant, but he still likes the money. It's not like he hates money. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Cause I was reading like, why was this making national news? And like every article I'm reading, I'm like, okay, so like why were people mad? And I think one of the reasons was they were almost saying that he's like too coached in PR. Like he's not a genuine person that he's like, coach to answer that and that's not how he actually feels like he's almost lying and saying that he's not doing it for the money when in reality he is which like dude like he's a not he's a class act center i think and i just i just think it's absurd to be angry about that i agree man i'm getting angry just talking about the people getting angry (laughs) yeah uh what about you what did you see this week I mean, kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but uh, Djokovic is uh, he pulled out of Paris. So mm. not going to be playing the last Masters of the year. We kind of saw this coming a little bit, but it does get, give a great opportunity for the last few guys trying to qualify for Turin. Obviously not really Tommy Paul because we just already lost, <laughs> but some guys that are on the edge there, maybe like Dimitrov, Deminar, those guys that are right on the cusp, don't know whether they're going to make it or not. We'll see uh, if they can slip past Djokovic in the the rankings here. And I also wanted to bring up another thing about uh, just the, uh, the indoor hardcore season. Cause obviously that's what's getting wrapped up here this week, but I wanted to give you a little bit of trivia, Eric uh, on mm-hmm. who do you think the top five indoor hardcore players are over the past year? And I'm using that website. I talked about last week that uh, does the uh, point separation for this. I do think you could maybe get one, two and four, but I think three and five will uh, will surprise you. Ooh, well, center number one, hundred percent. Center's number one, and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say Medvedev. Medvedev is not. Medvedev's not even in the top ten. Wow. Okay. So he's just riding he's on number uh, fourteen. Interesting. Well, remember last year who who did really well at the end of the year last oh. year? Oh, Djokovic. Yeah. So Djokovic obviously won ah. Paris last year. So that's a thousand points right there. But. The three through five, I think, are pretty surprising. And they're, they're very recent guys we actually talked about. Umber? Umber is number five. Oh, Because obviously oh, okay. he did really well at the beginning of the year. Remember, he had those, yeah. those couple yeah, of indoor yeah. tournament wins. I want me to give oh. you those last two. Yeah, give me the last so two. So number three is actually Hatchinoff. He's, he's gotten 735 points on indoor hard courts. Damn. Okay. And then number four is Draper. Draper, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the guys that have, have really just been really impressive on the, the indoor hard course over the last uh, 12 month period. Nice. Yeah. That's, uh, that's surprising. I didn't even think about Djokovic either. That was kind of a blunder as yeah. far as, uh, but I think know, also because it, it's one of those things where there are just are so few indoor hard court tournaments. Mm-hmm. So it's like we think about these recent ones and it's like these actually play such a big part in terms of how well someone has done over the full year because there's like some right after the uh uh australian and in that kind of weird period Mm -hmm. and then there's this period right now and other than that there's no indoor tournaments pretty much the whole year yeah yeah that's a good point uh i did want to say something earlier after your uh your news of the week but djokovic's pullout game pretty strong huh oh my god (laughs) I had to throw that I in had there. To, I had to. <laughs> As of late. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, how about bet of the week? What'd you go for this week? Bet of the week. I'm rolling with the French play parlay. So I'm taking Feast and Umber uh, at minus 119. So Feast is minus 330 over Chilich. I wanted to take that as just like a pure lock. But then, you know, I kind of wanted to sweeten it up a bit and then take him bear minus 240 over jerome because why not we're in we're in paris so i'm gonna take the two french players I don't yeah think I, I mean to... you did say you did say i think last time you said it was a lock it didn't necessarily hit so yeah. uh bold move especially since chilich has shown that he can sometimes pull out that form like he did uh earlier ah. this year when he won that tournament I know, but just like watching feast level for the last few weeks like it is so much higher i think um True. I mean, yeah, you kind of you're making me second guess, but I'm rolling with it. I don't think I need to say much on why basically Feast is level. Um, you know, Chilich is older, Feast is young, he's coming up. And then Umber, he's three and oh against Jerome. And I just like the matchup here. I um I, I think it's pretty funny. He actually beat him at this tournament last year, too. Like 
in two sets. So feels bad for your own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's got the French crowd behind him. I think both these players will do well. Solid. I, I about, respect it. How about you? Um, I'm going with uh, another Frenchman, Pesci Paracard, plus 135 over Tiafo. I mean, there's obviously a momentum bet for Paracard. He, uh, I think he'll be tired after having such a deep run in that, that last tournament, but I still think he can get it done here, especially since we know Tiafo can kind of be a, a hit or miss type of player. Yeah, I think Tiafo is he's gonna really look to try to move him around the court, like kind of give him junk, right? Like slice a lot, hit drop shots, because I don't yeah. think he can hang with him in a in a rally. Yeah, I mean it's tough tough to deal with uh, junk balls in it when you have a six eight frame. Yeah, I know. I like this bet. I think it's uh, yeah, it's one of those like all right you see the positive odds and you see some kind of discrepancy there. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Like this could be just a toss up. Mm -hmm. uh, how about match of the week? Match of the week. I'm going with Shelton surviving through feasts. And I love this match because uh, you mentioned this earlier. We have like two of the most exciting guys of that upcoming generation. Like obviously besides Alcaraz and center, those are going to be the main two. But then I also think you have guys like Shelton and Feast who are like really breaking out, starting to make a name for themselves. They're not quite top 10 yet, but I think they will be soon. And we kind of just got like a preview of what the future of tennis is going to look like. This level was super high, so much energy from both of them. You know, you had Shelton's high pitch screaming and then you had Feast engaging the crowd every time he hits a nice shot. He loves to do the little Djokovic, like hold his hand up, but uh, first set was a little uneventful. Like the points were still great, but Shelton took it 6 3. And then the second set went to an intense tiebreaker. Beast went up 5 0. And you pretty much thought, all right, this, this set's over. And then Ben battled back and it just went back and forth between set point for Feast and then match point for Shelton, like all the way. And Ben ultimately took it 11 9. And I feel like this was. A massive comeback like love a good comeback story but i think if feast had won that breaker it would have given him that momentum and i think he would have won the match i think after that um you know after losing a tiebreaker that long going to the third set i tend to think that the winner of the tiebreaker wins the third set i uh, yeah i i can see that that happening especially because having match points can be really a tough thing to deal with like you have that match point and then you go into another set and you're like, I could have had this match over like an hour ago. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's demoralizing. What was your match of the week? I also went with a, a Sheldon, uh, uh, Sheldon, Sheldon, young Sheldon. Yeah. So Shelton uh, beat Rublev in three sets. I also went with a, a Ben bet that, or a Ben uh, match this week. And uh, it was interesting even before it started because the match was delayed because there was like a pyrotechnic issue in the, the buildup. So there was like a smoky fog in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, and then overall, just I think it was interesting to see another match where how few points can make a difference in, in one of these critical matches where Shelton had two break points in the entire match, converted both of them, had one in the first and one in the third set, whereas Rublev had six and con converted zero. Uh, he ended up winning the second set in a tie break. So just interesting to see how small margins can make a huge impact. And like I said earlier, just a fun match to watch if you enjoy seeing those physical battles from the baseline with both guys just crushing the ball. Any good Rublev outbursts? Yeah, he had a couple nice. where he was just screaming at his box. <laughs> That's always fun to watch too. Yeah, I mean, not fun if you're if you're rooting for him, but I was I was kind of on uh, the team Shelton here. Yeah, good, good, USA. All right, and that's the show. If you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. You can find us on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube at Painting Lines Podcast. Feel free to shoot us a DM or email us any questions or thoughts at paintinglinespodcast at gmail.com.